Hello my loves, welcome back to another vlog. I just thought I would quickly sit down and actually introduce this vlog because I feel like I did very little talking where I literally just sat and had a chat, but this vlog ended up being very random. <laughs> Next week's vlog will have more of a theme to it, but this vlog has actually been building over the course of a few weeks now, and so there's just lots of little clips of what I've been up to, which hasn't actually been a lot, and sometimes life is just like that, you don't end up doing much. <laughs> but with spring approaching, I have been planting things, going out on lots of walks to see things grow, and I just figured I'd take you along with that. And of course we will have some book chat as well, showing you some books I've received, showing you things that I've been reading, lots of things like that. So I hope you enjoyed the vlog and I hope you have a wonderful day. There is a phrase that has always been in the back of my mind but it seems to be particularly relevant recently. And that phrase is, forgive your limitations. I've spoken before about toxic productivity and so many topics that branch away from that. And the sentiment of forgiving limitations has always been a kind of direct counteraction towards that. But recently it's taken on a new meaning, or rather, the meaning I actually needed was finally validated. I have spoken before very briefly about ongoing health issues. And I am pleased to say that after years of trying, I have finally received a diagnosis. Now I will largely be keeping the details to myself for many reasons. I am comfortable in letting you know at least that the basic diagnosis is chronic fatigue. While on the surface it may sound like a case of just being tired, I can attest that it is so much more than that. <laughs> for me it includes many different things, but some of the most notable ones are passing out asleep if I dare to pause in my day. It involves standard activities requiring I lay down for hours afterwards. It is brain fog. It includes chronic, untreatable leg pain. On the particularly bad days, it involves not being able to move my own body. It's unpredictability as my symptoms change every single day. It's a lot. <laughs> now, the reason why I'm saying all of this is purely for context, both for this video and for all future content. It's a huge part of my life that while I haven't hidden, I haven't felt validated enough to explain without a diagnosis, which could be a whole other video in and of itself. But it is something that has gradually become more obvious over the years. And for a long time, I actually hadn't realized this myself until more and more of you who have watched my videos, my live streams, and maybe have experienced chronic illnesses yourself, recognize the subtle signs and have reached out. <laughs> and I do just want to say that in a time when I questioned myself and my symptoms, that was a strange kind of assurance itself. And it means a lot to me that anyone took the time to express concerns or check in. So thank you for that. <laughs> But now I can say outright that this is a thing. And you may see signs of it here and there. Sudden sleepiness in live shows, for instance. Or even in how I've had to adapt these lifestyle vlogs to account for huge lapses in time. So we've adapted, and all of this is me managing. I have it a hell of a lot easier than most of the people with this condition. And I'm not saying that to belittle my own experience at all, it is just an acknowledgement. But I'm managing. It's not always easy, and it's not always graceful, but I'm managing nonetheless. All of this context is here for me to say that the idea of forgiving limitations is a concept at the forefront of my mind recently. And what I've come to realise is that while I think I know my limits, those limits change hour by hour. And me, with a mind that wants to take on the world via meticulously scheduled plans, mind and body don't always align and I'm having to coach myself into being okay with that to forgive my limitations, whatever they may be that day. One thing I'm trying to do is be more comfortable with slow days. I do feel like a little bit of a restless soul who always wants to wander around outside somewhere, but the reality is that I need more time of just resting at home. I'm really bad for convincing myself I'm having a slow day simply because I'm not moving at rapid speed, when actually I will still be doing things that exhaust me and I'll come away feeling more run down than before. And I have to admit, it's a frustrating thing to try and manage and balance when it's so unpredictable. But we can, and we shall try. 
So I think more recently I've just been focusing in on the slower moments or at least indulging more wholeheartedly in the ones that I already do. Reading, art, journaling. I've recently taken to just sitting by my window with tea at night. I have never felt my brain calm itself more than in those moments. It's unbelievable. I've planted seeds on my windowsill for spring. <laughs> it's my first attempt at growing anything from scratch as well as anything edible, so I imagine much time will be spent fussing over how well they're coming along. <laughs> it's easy to feel like you need to pack as much as you can within the weekends and evenings. Now I simply just want to slow it right back down again, so... This is me trying to do that. So I have been ill for the past five days now, I think, and I still sound a bit disgusting, so apologies for that, but I wanted so much to show you guys the remains of my birthday haul because shortly after filming my birthday unboxing I did actually receive a few more gifts from some of you lovely people and I didn't want my thanks to go unsaid and you guys seem to love book hauls so I thought I would show you them. I am just going to go through them fairly quickly because I have already opened them since I didn't know what they were when they were arriving and also because I do sound gross right now. <laughs> The one which I did briefly mention in the unboxing video was this one. This is I Hear the Sunspot Limit 1, which is kind of like the first in a companion series to the original I Hear the Sunspot series. This is a manga and this was gifted to me by Mike, who did also gift me another one and let me know that this one would be arriving later. So thank you so, so much, Mike. I am tempted just to binge this entire series because I think I have all minus one of them so I'm tempted to just blast my way through them but I really love this manga I talked about it a lot in the past book haul so go and check that out if you haven't already but thank you so so much Mike for adding this one to my collection. We also have this one from April which is Gothic an illustrated history. I was so excited to see this because as I mentioned in that book haul I had been really loving heavily illustrated or heavily photographed I guess? Non-fiction books. Non-fiction books which have a lot of imagery within them and this is exactly that sort of thing. So we have entire pages of really disturbing images because it is the gothic genre but I am just so excited to see all of these really creepy horrific things in context. I love anything to do with the gothic whether it be films, books, stories, aesthetic, architecture, anything like that so I am really looking forward to having a read of this so thank you so so much April for this. I then also received a couple of books from Christine so thank you so much Christine one of them was this graphic novel called The October Faction which honestly I don't know too much about but it just looks so cool I think this follows the Allen family who are monster hunters that is all I know this is the art style of it it kind of reminds me of the Adams family which I'm, I'm wondering if that's what the the play on the name is and apparently it's got a Netflix show so really excited to see what this is like it has a kind of dark and dreary color palette to it which I love so I'll let you know how this is very soon because I am so intrigued. <laughs> and she did also get me A Path of Darkness and Ruins by Marnie L Norton which Again, looks very gothic. Honestly, this one was one that pulled me in because of the cover. This one says on the back, The Fallow, a hollowed place, but sanctuary and prison for the beasts and creatures of the continent has been desecrated. The balance between the human and magical world has been ruptured. Rona is haunted by memories and revolts against the natures and traditions to which she has been born into. Part of, and family to, a traveller's community known as the Unwanted, she regards herself as an outsider with a dark secret. When a nighttime raid causes her brethren and family to flee across the continent in search for safer dwellings, Rona, along with her brother Roman and their friend Elias, cross paths with magical creatures of the Fallow. This new path and twist of fate sets them on the course of self-discovery, magic and redemption. I just... I'm intrigued, okay? So thank you so much Christine for this wonderfully gothic and dark little book haul. I am so intrigued about these. <laughs> I then received a couple of books from Hannah from Letter M. Completely by surprise because these weren't from my wishlist or anything so these just appeared in the mail at random and I am so intrigued. I feel like Hannah has done a really good job at pinpointing my kind of book because first of all we have The Mad Woman's Ball by Victoria Mass. I don't know too much about this one besides it being in a French setting. All of Paris is in the thrall of Dr. Charcot. Charcot? I don't know. I can't even speak in an English accent normally right now, never mind a French one. And his displays of hypnotism on women who have been deemed mad or hysterical. But the truth is more complicated. These women are often inconvenient, unwanted wives or strong-willed daughters. 
Once a year, a grand event is held, the Mad Woman's Ball. It is a highlight of the social season. For the women themselves, it is a rare moment of hope. Genevieve is a senior nurse who has placed her faith in the Doctor and his new science. But everything changes when she meets Eugenie, the daughter of a bourgeois family. For Eugenie has a secret and she needs Genevieve's help. Their fates will collide on the night of the Mad Woman's Ball. I've heard that this is another one which is pretty gothic and I really like things to do with an unstable or uncertain mental state, I guess, or so things like hypnotism or just anything that can influence the mind and make you think things that aren't quite real or people having an uncertain mental state and trying to prove that things are true, things are false, things like that. It's all very much an intrigue for me, so very interested in this. And then she also sent me The Divines by Ellie Eaton, which I'd never heard of before, but this sounds almost like a dark academia. I don't know if it would quite fit under that, but we do have a school setting at least because this one says the girls at St John the Divine were fiercely loyal, sharp-tongued and cutting in a way that only teenage girls can be. But Josephine, now in her 30s, hasn't spoken to another divine for 15 years, not since the day her boarding school shut its doors in disgrace. When an impromptu visit reawakens memories of those doomed final weeks, Josephine circles to the ugly secret at the heart of the school scandal. The more Josephine recalls, the further her life unravels, derailing not just her marriage and career but her entire sense of self. And this apparently is an exploration of the intoxicating destructive relationships between teenage girls. So I am intrigued to see if it does lean into dark academia, or if it is more of like a thriller that's just set in a school setting, or if those things are just very inherently linked. <laughs> but we shall soon find out. So thank you very much, Hannah, for those two. And breathe. <laughs> I can't breathe through my nose, so every time I'm talking, I'm like... <laughs> Next up we have a book from Emily, which I did not expect this book to be this big because this one is A Helen of Troy by Margaret George and this is big, this is chunky. This one is a Greek myth retelling and honestly that is the only reason why I want to read it because every single time I see a Greek myth retelling I'm just like, yep, thank you, I'll take that. As you can imagine, it centers around the Trojan War and Helen of Troy. I really don't know what sort of take this is gonna have on it. I don't know what can possibly take this many words, but I will find out. <laughs> it does say on the back that Margaret George, the highly acclaimed best-selling historical novelist, has turned her intelligent perceptive eye to this all too human story of passion, regret and vengeance. So I do think that this is a more historical take rather than the fantasy side of Greek mythology, but it's a Greek myth retelling. I'm intrigued. I am feeling the urge to return to Greek myth retellings, so good timing, good timing. Thank you, Emily. And I know that Emily said that she is also very intrigued about this one too, so hopefully if you pick it up, you will also enjoy it too. And then I have a book from Fran Fran, or just Fran, depending. It's written as Fran Fran, so I'm, that, that's what I'm gonna say. But this one is The Witches of New York by Amy McKay. This book, I swear, has gone through so many cover changes. It has a wildly different cover in the US. I do prefer the US cover, but it's whatever. We'll not talk about that. Because this book sounds really, really interesting. I think we've all figured out that right now I'm currently just collecting books to do with witchcraft, whether it be non-fiction or fiction. It's always been a thing of some sort, but you know, I'm kind of returning to that little subcategory of book. <laughs> so I've been avidly seeking out more books that are like this and this one just keeps coming up and I really want to read it. So this one is set in 1880, witches Adelaide Tom and Eleanor St. Clair have opened a tea shop in Manhattan specialising in cures, palmistry and potions. When an enchanting woman called Beatrice joins the witches as an apprentice, she soon proves indispensable, but her new life is marred by strange occurrences. She sees things no one else can see, she hears voices no one else can hear. Has she been touched by magic or is she simply losing her mind? Amongst the witches tug of war over how best to nurture her gifts that Beatrice disappears but was it by choice or by force? In a time when women were closer to confined and committed for merely speaking their minds, is anyone really safe? And then on the front here it says, those averse to magic need not apply. I'm just intrigued by the vibe of this book, which is again a reason why I prefer the US cover where it has like a woman in a almost like a masquerade mask. I just feel like that vibe would suit this book much more, or at least that's what I've been led to believe, but it's more about what is on the inside than what is on the cover, so I am very intrigued, love a witchy story. Hopefully this is gonna be one that I just adore. So thank you so much for that one. And then the final book we have here is one which I really wish I had filmed my reaction to opening this one because I went through stages of confusion to surprise 
to like giddy excitement and it seemed really weird because of what the book is so this was sent by Gail and we're gonna read the note out as well because Gail said happy belated birthday Ashley I know you like true crime now that you live in Edinburgh I thought you might like this I bought it when I was there early this year and it has some really interesting tales enjoy because this book is Murder Houses of Edinburgh by Jan Bonderson I didn't know this book existed but as I realized what this book was I got far too excited because as Gail pointed out I really like true crime. All I watch are true crime documentaries, YouTubers who tell true crime stories, particularly murder stories. I don't know what it is, it's just a morbid fascination. If you know, you know. <laughs> There's a whole group of people in the world who are fascinated by this kind of thing and I am one of them. And I believe a murder house is literally just any house or building which has seen a murder in it. I believe the term was coined because of like infamous murder houses so places where people really know the story of that building and what happened in there but this book does exactly what it says on the tin. It lists off all of the stories, or not all of them, but it lists off a whole bunch of stories about various buildings in Edinburgh that have seen a murder happen or various streets in Edinburgh and what's even more exciting is that there are actually photos of the places, both in terms of photographs or drawings or postcards for instance from way back in the day when these happened because some of these cases are particularly old ones. Also a modern day photograph of what that building looks like now if it still exists and I'm just <laughs> envisioning me walking around the streets of Edinburgh going someone was murdered there and uh, while that sounds terrifying <laughs> I like stories, I like history, I love knowing this kind of thing. One of my favourite things is walking around the streets and just having stories to associate with those streets, so this is great for me, I love this. <laughs> I'm aware of how creepy that sounds. Most people do not want to know if someone was murdered in the building you're walking past, but uh, we're just, I'm not gonna try and justify it. If you know, you know. <laughs> but I am aware of how gradually grotty I'm sounding more and more so now that I've shown you those books I am going to go and I don't know do something probably cook food in all honesty and I'll check in with you again soon I feel like a good example actually of how I trick myself into thinking that I am much calmer about a lot of situations than I actually am is when it comes to reading updates in my videos when I initially planned this vlog my reactions to House of Sky and Breath were meant to be in it. When it came round to me reading it, I just had a very low energy time period and did not end up recording anything. And so I just had this really uneasy feeling around reading that book for a while, which is silly. <laughs> it's so ridiculous because it's just a book. It's just reading. I know that you guys will be patient with me. I know that you guys will be here to listen to my opinion on this book whenever it comes in whatever form it comes. But then I just kept trying to think of what books to include. I wanted to try and include some action shots of me reading, some live reactions, but it's just not been working recently and just work with what we can do. So preparing you for the update that you are about to see in which I have already read the books that I was going to tell you about. <laughs> So my reading has been the definition of sporadic recently and I've just been picking up anything. <laughs> but I wanted to tell you about a couple that I finished this week because I have quite a few thoughts on them so I just thought I'd share. So we do have a couple of books, the first of which is in My Dreams, I Hold a Knife by Ashley Winstead. This one is a thriller that I picked up because I saw that somebody mentioned this being on the dark academia side of thrillers and anything that has even vague dark academia vibes, I want it. So I picked this up on a whim and I really, really enjoyed it. This actually reminded me a lot of If We Were Villains, but without being quite so heavy on the academic side of thing and without the Shakespeare, <laughs> but more in the sense of the group dynamics within the story, everybody having like a role to fill and how they fit into that, how that works within the group dynamic and it's just... Oof. This is a ride of a book, so this does follow the very typical storyline that you would expect within a dark academia story in which you have a group of people within a school setting or university setting, college, whatever you want to call it. Someone is murdered at some point, one of them is accused of said murder. In this one we keep switching between the present day and the past in which everybody has gone back for homecoming and is now being reaccused of having something to do with the murder. And I really don't know what else to say about it besides it was super addictive and I really believe 
relieved the kind of academic rivalry that was going on between everybody within this group, even though they were really close friends. I will say that I kept getting some of the characters confused for each other, so I do think that the characters needed to be built up just a little bit more, at least when it came to the people who didn't really have a perspective, but it still made for a really entertaining story and I think that this actually does have really good Dark Academia vibes, more so than a lot of Dark Academia recommendations that I see, so if you're looking for a thriller with Dark Academia vibes then I think that this one would be it and I was really pleasantly surprised. The writing as well is lovely. I never really expect much from the writing style within thriller stories because they are generally more plot based but I feel like this was just written really nicely and was an all-round good read. On the other hand however, <laughs> We have Gallant by V.E. Schwab. Now, I didn't actually intend to read this one so soon because I still need to read Adi LaRue and I just have a feeling I'm gonna love that one, but I am going to an event for this book so I just decided to pick it up, especially because it is quite tiny. This one is a whimsical fantasy following a girl called Olivia Pryor who is mute, she can't speak, who lives in a kind of school for orphaned girls and in the beginning she receives a letter from her uncle saying that she has a home at a place called Gallant. Now, she has never even known that she had family. But when she arrives at Gallen, she discovers that her uncle actually died. Weird things happen at Gallen, and it's said that if the prior family go there, they can't leave. And so we start discovering what on earth is going on at Gallen. Now, I didn't really go into this book with any expectations, really, because my relationship with V. Schwab books are currently very very rocky, very unstable. And honestly, I think this just proved the point because I only rated this 2.5 out of five stars, so not great. <laughs> and it's not because it was a bad book, it had lovely writing, but honestly, I feel like that's all I can say about it because this book was just so forgettable to me. I feel like I had read the story a million times before. And also at this point, I am now noticing the tropes or imagery that V. Schwab likes to repeat a lot within their stories. So I've noticed that V. Schwab tends to write stories about there being a line between some kind of world that a young girl can cross between and female main characters to me are beginning to feel very samey, even down to how they look a lot of them. So I don't really know what to do with that and I think what this book has made me realise is that if I am going to continue reading V. E. Schwab books I just need to stick with her distinctly adult books because this one is, I guess, a young adult book, but it almost feels a little bit on the younger side. I don't know why, actually. It just seemed a bit juvenile. So while it was fine and I read it really quickly, I just wasn't bothered about it. And like I said, it will be largely forgettable. So unfortunately, this one wasn't for me. And I think I have come to the conclusion that I'm going to read Adelie Rue, see what my opinion is on that one, and have that decide whether I do just stick to V. E. Schwab's adult books or whether I just give up entirely because I've had just a few that have been mediocre and I'm buying far too many V. Schwab books to just be having mediocre stories at this point. So Adi LaRue will be the deciding factor. I do have faith that I will really enjoy that one and I do think that it will just be V. Schwab's adult books that I need to lean in towards but we'll see. <laughs> So those are the books that I'd be reading this week. I do also have Robin Hobbs' Blood of Dragons on the go, but I'm just reading that quite slowly. I'm listening to the audiobook basically whenever I'm tidying my flat or anything like that, so don't really have too many opinions on that one currently because I'm not too far in, but I think I am actually going to start my reading for next week's vlog, so I think in the meantime, we'll wrap this one up here. So apologies for it being very random. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed it nonetheless. If you did make it this far into the video then leave some kind of flower emoji because we're heading into spring so why not. But in the meantime I shall love you and leave you and let you get on with the rest of your day so I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did then remember to leave a like and a comment so let me know that you're here. If you're not subscribed already then please consider doing so. Down in the description box you'll find information to all the books I've mentioned, all of my social media and other bookish stuff as well so be sure to check that out if you haven't already but for now I hope you're having a lovely day and I shall see you next time with a new video. Bye!